The second part of this course aims at providing the student with the means to conduct a gender-aware policy impact analysis. We will show the steps to develop a CGE model with simple gender components. The CGE model is calibrated to real data. Using the Zambian economy as an example, we simulate an agricultural subsidy policy. The results of the policy simulation are analyzed under several assumptions. The design of a CGE model for gender-aware policy simulations can be implemented in several ways as presented in the first part of this module. The first and most important step consists in understanding the gendered relations in the economy you are focusing on. While the CGE model is a means of simulating policies or shocks to analyze the gender-differentiated effects, the structure of the economy is determining all gender dimensions the researcher wants to analyze need to be supported by data in order to be directly or indirectly incorporated in the CGE model. In this module, we will provide examples of how this can be implemented, starting with the basics. We will present the steps to conduct a gender-aware CGE analysis such as this. After constructing the data set and model, we will run policy simulations to show the relevance of introducing a gender lens into the analytical framework. We will also demonstrate the importance of gender relations and structures in influencing the outcome of policies. A CGE model is calibrated to a social accounting matrix, SAM. Our example will use the case of the Zambian economy. We have a SAM for 2010, Simuchimba et al. 2019. We have aggregated the SAM such that it contains six key activities, namely agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, mining and quarrying, manufacturing, utilities, construction, and services. Seven commodities, which are the same as above but including food processing. Two factors of production, labor and capital. Five tax accounts, direct, indirect, production, and import taxes, and social contributions. Four institutions, households, rural and urban, firms, government, and the rest of the world. And two investment accounts, gross fixed capital formation or savings, and stock variations. The first step consists in differentiating labor supply and demand between male and female workers. A standard SAM usually comprises one labor account where the wage bill, or remuneration of employees, by activity, is registered without distinguishing the type of workers. The modeler's first task is to decompose this account into labor payments to male and female workers. The data required to split the wage bill of workers in the production sectors can be obtained from a household income survey or a labor force survey. These data sets usually provide the number of workers and wages in the different key economic activities of a country. We can see from the macro SAM that there is one account for wages and salaries, which combines all categories of workers. For example, 5,215 represents the wage bill related to the total production in the agricultural sector. Our objective is to split this expenditure in two distinguishing payments to male and female workers. The decomposition of the labor accounts requires data on employment, generally available in labor force surveys, LFS, or household income surveys. In the case of Zambia, the Central Statistical Office, CSO, has conducted an LFS in 2012. The following data allows us to decompose the labor accounts. In Table 1, we have information on the number of workers by industry and sex. Table 2 provides information on average monthly earnings, distinguished by sex and rural or urban locations. From the above two tables, we can extract information on female labor market participation. With simple calculations, 
we can see that there is a difference between men and women, both in terms of number of workers and in terms of remuneration. Agriculture is the largest employer in Zambia, employing a little over half of both women and men. Table 1. Although women represent 52% of workers in the sector, they cost 37.5% of the wage bill. Table 3. This is explained by the wage differential between male and female workers in rural areas. Table 2. A similar analysis is conducted for the remaining five sectors of the macro-Zambian SAM with similar gender gaps, although at different rates. The wage bill in Table 3 is used to decompose the labor accounts of the SAM. This also determines the level of contribution of female labor to household income. The SAM has now two labor accounts, one for males and one for females. Households will receive their income from each. We can see that from the GSAM, accounts, accounts in columns 14 and 15, women contribute half the amount contributed by men to household labor income in both rural and urban settings. Now that the SAM is ready, the CGE model should be adapted to account for this differentiation and to introduce other specifications that could capture gender differences. We start by determining the functional form that could represent the relationship between male and female labor in the production process. The constant elasticity of substitution, CES form, is chosen because it allows for four ways to combine male and female labor depending on the value of the elasticity of substitution. These are also activity-specific and can represent the following situations. Perfect complementarity if the elasticity of substitution is nil. Perfect substitutability if the elasticity is infinite. A Cobb-Douglas type of combination if the elasticity is 1. Constant budget slash expenditure shares. An imperfect substitution with low substitutability if elasticity is lower than 1, and high substitutability if elasticity is higher than 1. A nested structure is usually adopted to describe the production process in CGE models. At the top level, output combines value added and total intermediate consumption. At the next level, value added is a combination of labor and capital. In a situation where there is no distinction between male and female workers, value added is a combination of composite labor and capital. With a gender decomposition of labor, we introduce an additional level to the nested production structure. At the fourth level, composite labor combines male and female labor. This is the simplest way of introducing a gender dimension to the CGE model. As presented above, the CES function is used to combine male and female labor. The functional forms are written as follows. Equation 1 is a CES function of composite labor demand, LD of J, that combines female labor demand, LDFEM of J, LS1, and male labor demand, LDMAL of J, LS2. Equation 2 determines female labor demand relative to male labor demand. The labor market is segmented by sex of worker. Equation 3 and 4 determine the labor market equilibrium conditions, where total female labor supply, LSFEM, is equal to the sum of female labor demand from the J industries and similarly for male workers. At this stage, the equilibrium male, WMAL and female WFEM wages are determined. WF of J and WM of J represent the sectoral male and female wages. They represent the economy-wide male and female equilibrium wages when we assume perfect intersectoral mobility of male and female labor, hence equations 6 and 7. Labor supply constraints are represented in equations 8 and 9. Male and female labor supply is a function of real wages. 
If the elasticity of labor supply, epsilon, is equal to zero, labor supply is fixed and wages adjust to equalize supply and demand. If it is equal to infinite, wages are fixed and labor supply is entirely driven by labor demand. When epsilon is between zero and infinite, both labor supply and wages are flexible. The sectoral wage, W of J, represented in the equation 5, is a weighted average of male and female wages. In further, for, further, for further details, for further details and a demonstration on how to implement this in the GAMS in the GAMS software, practical examples are provided on the PEP website at the MPIA training materials section. Gender decomposition of market work is the first step to explain unequal gender patterns in the labor market. Even with a simplified approach to incorporate gender dimensions to policy analysis with a CGE methodology, the assumption on the relationship between male and female labor in the aggregate labor demand function and the constraints linked to labor supply of male and female workers are important determinants of policy outcomes or simulation results. In this section, we discuss different elasticities of substitution between male and female labor and intersectoral mobility of female labor compared to male labor. Labor supply is still exogenous at this stage. We make different assumptions and analyze the simulation results, including the following. In our first assumption, the labor market is segmented by gender. There is a perfect intersectoral mobility of labor. We assume that labor supply is exogenous and equals to the sum of sectoral labor demand through the adjustment of nominal wages for both male and female labor. Two situations are considered under our first assumption. High substitution between male and female labor in the production process with sigma j equal to 6, ls3. Low substitution between male and female labor in the production process with sigma j equaling to 0 0.8. The second assumption represents a segmented labor market by gender and rural urban or agricultural non-agricultural sectors. There are four labor markets, agricultural female, agricultural male, non-agricultural female, and non-agricultural male. We assume that non-agricultural labor supply is exogenous and equal to the sum of sectoral labor demand through the adjustment of non-agricultural wages for both male and female labor categories. Agricultural labor supply is endogenous for both male and female labor categories, while nominal wages are exogenous. Two variants are analyzed. High substitution between male and female labor in the production process with sigma j equaling to 6, and low substitution between male and female labor in the production process with sigma j equaling to 0 0.8. The third assumption treats labor supply as an endogenous variable. Labor supply is a function of market variables because it evolves positively with wages. Leisure and domestic work are not directly introduced in the model in this introductory course. To account for these non-marker variables, we impose a constraint on labor supply through the value of the elasticity of labor supply to real wages. In variants 3.1 and 3.2, both male and female labor is unconstricted. We adopt a high elasticity of both male and female labor supply to real wages. The difference between 3.1 and 3.2 comes from the assumption on the substitutability between male and female labor. A high substitution between male and female labor in the production process, with sigma j equaling 6, implies that the employer is almost indifferent to employing either. With a low substitution between male and female labor, with sigma j equaling 0.8, labor demand and or wages will increase more for the factor with the highest intensity. Variant 3.3 adopts a situation where female labor supply is constrained 
while male labor supply is unconstrained, along with a high substitution between male and female labor. Variant 3.4 adopts a situation where female labor supply is constrained while male labor supply is unconstrained, but male and female labor are imperfectly substitutable with an elasticity lower than 1. Variant 3.5 attempts to demonstrate the situation where female labor supply is constrained compared to male labor supply as in 3.3 and 3.4 with the peculiarity that women in agricultural, or rural implicitly, sectors are different than those in non-agricultural or urban sectors. We impose an inelastic female non-agricultural labor supply, while women employed in non-agricultural sectors have a less constrained labor supply. Gender gaps can be of various types. CGE models can capture gender gaps in labor force participation, productivity, wages, or skills, among others. Introducing gender gaps in CGE models requires data that captures this gap. Using the Zambian example, we can introduce gender wage gaps and gaps in labor force participation. To do this, we use the data on wages and employment provided in Tables 1, 2, and 3. Using these three tables, we can calculate the wage differential between urban and rural and between male and female wages. We find that rural male wages are 1.8 times higher than rural female wages. Urban female wages are 1.5 times higher than rural female wages. Urban male wages are 1.5 times higher than urban female wages. After aggregating the sectors into agriculture, manufacturing, and services, we know that 52% of the agricultural labor force is composed of women, 18% of the manufacturing labor force is composed of women. The implementation of gender wage and employment gaps is introduced at the calibration stage of the modeling exercise. This means that instead of proceeding with normalized wages across all categories of workers, gender wage gaps are introduced. To do this, we calibrate the variables WFEM, LS4, of J, and WMAL of J, such that agricultural female wage is equal to 1, agricultural male wages is equal to 1.8, female wages in manufacturing and services is equal to 1.5, and male, and male wages in manufacturing and services is equal to 2.3. After this, we can calibrate labor demand such that it uses the wage differential we just introduced. Labor demand is calibrated as the ratio between the wage bill, which is obtained from the SAM, and wages for each category of worker by sector. By doing this, we introduce at the same time wage differentials between male and female workers, but also differences in the number of workers or labor units in each of the three sectors for male and female labor. It should be noted that it is possible to use the actual number of workers to calibrate labor demand and afterwards calculate the wage rate by using the ratio between wage bill and number of workers. This section uses the Zambian case to illustrate the benefits of gender decomposition of market work when analyzing policies. We are looking to provide answers to questions such as, are simulation results affected by the fact that we distinguish male and female labor? Do the values of the elasticity of substitution between male and female labor affect the simulation results? How does the fact that women are able to move from one sector to another to seek employment in the same way or differently as men affect the results? If women and men have different or similar constraints affecting their labor supply decisions, how does this affect simulation results? What is the impact of closing gender gaps in wages for female employment and contribution to household income? Tables 4.1 to 8 provide answers to the above questions. 
We implement an illustrative policy scenario where the government provides production subsidies to the agricultural sector, representing 30% of the value of agricultural production. The policy is financed by increasing public deficit, which in turn has a crowding out effect on private investment. The model closure is such that government consumption is maintained as exogenous, tax rates are fixed, and government savings are endogenous. Any increase in expenditure will result in a higher deficit if it is not met by an equivalent increase in government revenue. Investment is savings-driven, foreign savings are exogenous, and the nominal exchange rate is fixed. In the first step of our policy analysis, we compare the simulation results of the same policy scenario with and without gender differentiation in the labor market. In this example, the labor market is segmented by gender and there is perfect intersectoral mobility of labor. Labor supply is exogenous and both male and female nominal wages are endogenous. This is the scenario 1.1, where we impose a high substitution between male and female labor in the production process with sigma j equaling 6, and the scenario 1.2 with low substitution between male and female labor in the production process with sigma j equaling 0 0.8. The simulation results are presented in tables 4.1, 5.1, 6.1, and 7.1. If we compare columns 1 and 1.1, we can see that the results are almost the same for national accounts indicators. With a low substitution between male and female labor represented in column 1.2, the impact on the GDP and its expenditure components and on sectoral production remains nearly unchanged. Composite labor demand also remains similar to the high substitution case. What is the use, then, of distinguishing female labor from male labor? At this stage, the distinction between male and female labor gives us information on the gender differentiated employment effect. The production subsidy in the agricultural sector is likely to create more jobs for men than women when we assume a perfect intersectoral labor mobility, regardless of the degree of substitution between male and female labor. The implication of our assumption on substitution between male and female labor affects wages Table 6. The agricultural production subsidy increases female wages more than male wages. However, if we assume that female labor plays an important role in the agricultural sector by adopting a low substitution of their work to that of men, the impact on wages is nearly double, reaching a 9.3% increase. With high substitution, male wages increase by 4.7% while the increase is 2.8% in the low substitution case. This has an impact on the contribution of female labor to household income relative to that of males. Table 7. The impact on the contribution to household income is the same as the wage effect given the exogenous labor supply assumption. If we make the assumption that the labor market is segmented such that both men and women cannot freely move between agricultural and non-agricultural sectors, the agricultural subsidy policy has a different result. Example 2 presents the results of the policy simulation under the assumption 2. There are four labor markets, agricultural female, agricultural male, non-agricultural female, and non-agricultural male. We assume that non-agricultural labor supply is exogenous, Agricultural labor supply is endogenous for both male and female labor categories, and nominal agricultural wages are exogenous. 2.1 is the high substitution case between male and female labor in the production process, with sigma j equaling 6. 2.2 is the low substitution assumption between male and female labor in the production process, with sigma j equaling 0 
The scope of the impact of agricultural production subsidies is higher but also opposite at times compared to results of the perfect intersectoral mobility scenario. If we compare columns 2.1 and 2.2 with 1, 1.1, and 1.2, we can see that the growth effect is positive, tables 4.2. Rural and urban households have slightly higher consumption gains. Agricultural production increases as well. This is because agricultural labor supply can increase as much as necessary in line with the assumption on the segmentation of the labor market between the agricultural and non-agricultural sectors. The employment effect is gender neutral. Table 5. The segmentation of the labor market between agricultural and non-agricultural sectors combined with fixed agricultural nominal wages and endogenous agricultural labor supply results in similar increases in male and female labor demand. Furthermore, while male labor demand remains close to the results in the perfect mobility assumption, female labor demand in the agricultural sector increases from 15.8% to 21.5 percent. In our previous assumptions, we would have concluded that the agricultural subsidy policy increases the gender gap in employment. With the new assumption, the policy is gender neutral. Table 6.2 presents the impact on wages. We can see that the perfect mobility assumption results in higher wages for both women and men with female wages increasing more than male wages. In the segmented market approach, the evolution is similar, but the scope of the increase is lower. While a high substitution results in a 3.4% increase in female wages, a low substitution results in a 7% increase with no effect on male wages. The impact on labor income affects the contribution of men and women to household income. In Table 7.2, Columns 2.1 and 2.2 show that if we are in a context where labour mobility between agricultural and non-agricultural sectors is limited, a production subsidy will have a higher income effect. If we look at the gender differentiated income effects, it will also favour women's contribution to the family income. This table shows how our understanding or perception and modeling of the gender relations in the labor market shape the simulation results. Example 3 analyzes the simulation results with unconstrained and endogenous female and male labor supply. Labor supply is a function of market variables with a different elasticity for males and females. We do not explicitly introduce leisure and domestic work, but make the hypothesis that men and women can easily increase their labor supply. In 3.1, male and female labor supply are perfectly elastic, and there is a high substitution between male and female labor in the production process, with sigma j equaling 6. In 3.2, we assume a low substitution between male and female labor in the production process with sigma j equaling 0 0.8. If we assume a perfectly elastic female and male labor supply, fixed real wages, perfect intersectoral mobility of labor, the scope of the growth and welfare gains is greater. The results in column 3.1 and 3.2 are much higher than those in 2.1 and 2.2. The impact on employment is also very positive for both male and female workers, and the policy is equally benefiting men and women. Example 4 provides an illustrative simulation where we assume a constrained endogenous female labor supply and an unconstrained male labor supply. In most countries, female labor supply is more likely to be constrained than male labor supply. This is because women are more likely to have greater childcare responsibilities and a heavier burden of housework. Beyond asymmetric division of tasks within the household, cultural norms can also affect the ease with which women can increase their labour market participation in response to market incentives. 
The assumption of an unconstrained labor supply is strong and may not be realistic in some cases. The elasticity of a female labor supply is often to be constrained. To demonstrate this, we adopt a case where male labor supply is perfectly elastic but not female labor supply. In scenario 3.3, we assume a high elasticity of male labor supply to real wages and a low elasticity of female labor supply. This is combined with a high substitution between male and female labor in the production process with sigma j equaling 6. 3.4 differs from 3.5 in that the substitution between male and female labor in the production process is low with sigma j equaling 0 0.8. The columns 3.3 and 3.4 present the results of the agricultural subsidy policy under these constraints for female labor supply. We can see that compared to an unconstrained female labor supply hypothesis, the growth and welfare gains are lower. Production increases but at a lesser pace than in the unconstrained model. Overall, constraining female labor supply elasticity does not change the direction of the impact of the agricultural subsidy. It reduces the gains. This means that gender inequalities may undermine achievement of macroeconomic objectives. The impact on the creation of female employment is very small. Female employment increased by as little as 3.9% in the agricultural sector while that of male employment registered a 38.8% increase. Even if we assume that male and female labor are imperfect substitutes with low substitution elasticity, 3.4, female employment increased by 13.5% compared to 28.7% for males. If we assume that female labor supply is constrained, an agricultural subsidy policy although it does not deteriorate the situation of female workers, will tend to widen the gender gap by creating more employment opportunities for male workers. Our objective here is to demonstrate how the initial gender structure of the economy, the assumptions we adopt to capture gender disparities, and the way we introduce gender dimensions in the CGE model can affect the results. The importance of a gender analytical lens is also clearly presented in our simulation results. Example 5 provides the agricultural subsidy simulation results with inelastic female agricultural labor supply and an unconstrained male labor supply. Our final example makes the assumption that female workers are differentiated not only by the agricultural versus non-agricultural divide, but also through the degree of constraints to their labor supply. While agricultural female workers have an inelastic labor supply, 0 0.3, females in non-agricultural sectors have a higher elasticity of labor supply, 1.5, while men's labor supply is perfectly elastic. The results are presented in column 3.5. Looking at the results of the simulation, we see that despite a positive shock in the economy, female agricultural labor supply increases by only 1.6%, while male agricultural labor supply increases by 40.3%. The key messages of this illustrative example show that the gender decomposition of the model can provide information on the potential gender-differentiated impacts of policies, and that it is important to define the assumptions of the CGE model based on existing gender relations by introducing as much detail as possible. Distinguishing women by location, sector of employment, skill, marital status and motherhood, etc. can be important attributes that could affect the policy outcome. The same policy scenario can have an employment effect ranging from 1.6% to 26.8%. This final example illustrates how a GECGE model can be used in analyzing gender wage gaps. The simulation is the same as the other examples, 
that is, a production subsidy in the agricultural sector. As well as this, we implement an increase in female agricultural wages such that the gender wage gap is closed by 50%. While interpreting the results, we should keep in mind that male and female workers are imperfectly substitutable with a substitution elasticity of 0 0.8. The elasticity of labor supply is the same for male and female workers and set at 0 0.3. Labor can easily move between agriculture, manufacturing, and services. The simulation results suggest that using some of the production subsidies to close the agricultural wage gap has positive growth and welfare effects. Table 8 shows that the real GDP increases by 1.3% compared to its level in the reference scenario. Closing the agricultural gender wage gap by half implies a 51.9% increase in female wages in the agricultural sector, while that of males remains unchanged. Increasing female wages makes the use of female labor more costly in agricultural production. That is why female labor demand declines by 7.1%. Due to the subsidies, agricultural production increases. To produce more, the agricultural sector reduces female labor demand, increases male labor demand, and demand for intermediate inputs. Capital is assumed to be sector-specific and exogenous. The expansion of the agricultural sector positively affects manufacturing as services output. Both rural and urban households have income gains. From a gender perspective, both male and female workers benefit from the allocation of government subsidies for the reduction of the agricultural gender wage gap. Despite lower employment levels, female labor income increases and increases at a higher rate than for their male counterpoints. Female workers are able to significantly increase their contribution to the household income. Furthermore, by having the gender wage gap, both male and female workers gain. This means that closing the gap does not come at the disadvantage of male employment or wages. There is, however, a trade-off of reducing the gender wage gap. It makes female labor more expensive and might affect female employment, at least temporarily. By allocating a share of the subsidies to increase female wages, the agricultural output gain is smaller. This course aimed at providing the student with the means to conduct a gender-aware policy impact analysis. Using a simplified approach based on a real economy, we illustrated how a CGE model can incorporate gender dimensions. Policies are not gender-neutral, even if we adopt the simplest modeling approach and treat women and men as homogenous workers because of pre-existing gender structures. It is important to have reliable data which is disaggregated to the largest extent possible. This is the first and most important step in conducting gender-sensitive analysis. The initial gender structure matters when interpreting and understanding simulation results and for framing the policy message. The results of the policy simulation were analyzed under several assumptions. This demonstrated how the same policy shock can yield different results. For this reason, the assumptions of the CGE model need to reflect existing gender relations.